Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for that hushed pause. Uh, my name is Sarah Bean Borg. I'm the Senior Exhibitions Manager here at the Aga Khan Museum, and it gives me sincere pleasure to welcome you on this cloudy, sunny day. The Aga Khan Museum opened three years ago in September 2014, and during this time, we've presented 15 exhibitions highlighting everything from exquisite Mughal miniature paintings and the marvelous creatures found in medieval art from places all along the maritime and overland silk routes to contemporary Arab artists exploring the shape-shifting politics and culture of the Middle East and North Africa, as well as ancient masterpieces and modern creations from the living history of Syria, among many others. With here, locating contemporary Canadian artists, we welcome our first showcase of Canadian art. This exhibition connects with the overall mission of the museum, which is dedicated to advancing the values of pluralism by connecting cultures through the universally accessible language of art. The 21 artists featured in here come from diverse backgrounds with many places, influences, and experiences, adding to their identity as Canadian. While the backgrounds of the artists are diverse, what connects all of them in their art practice is that they explore and question the complex identities and layered histories of people, places, and objects. It's fitting that we open this exhibition in a city as multicultural as Toronto, and in an institution as devoted to pluralism as the Aga Khan Museum. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the Aga Khan Museum sits, known as Takaranto. Uh, I'd li also like to honor the stewardship, past, present, and future, of the Huron-Wendat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This acknowledgement is especially important to us today because here is the Aga Khan Museum's way of marking the 150th year of Canada's formation as a nation. With all our many identities, we acknowledge the people who first welcomed newcomers to Turtle Island. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, and one of the artists featured in the exhibition, George Eliot Clark, the fourth Poet Laureate of Toronto and the seventh Parliamentary Poet Laureate. George is a revered wordsmith. He's a noted artist in song, drama, fiction, screenplays, essays, and poetry. He's now teaching African-Canadian literature at the University of Toronto. Clark has also taught at Duke, McGill, the University of British Columbia, and Harvard. He holds eight honorary doctorates, plus appointments to the Order of Nova Scotia and the Order of Canada. His recognitions include the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellows Prize, the Governor General's Award for Poetry, the National Magazine Gold Award for Poetry, the Premiul Poesis from Romania, the Dartmouth Book Award for Fiction, the Eric Hoffer Book Award for Poetry in the US, and the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Achievement Award. Clark's work is the subject of Africadian Atlantic, Essays on George Eliot Clark, edited by Joseph Pivato. May I take a brief second to be a tiny bit self-indulgent, but I discovered through this exhibition that George and I share a lovely common thread. My late father was one of George's undergraduate professors at the University of Waterloo, and we recently were able to share our happy memories of my dad in what felt like the most sincere and friendly Canadian way for two strangers to connect by email. May I now remind you to turn your cell phone to silent and that there is no photography or video during the lecture and will you please join me in warmly welcoming George to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Sarah for the wonderful welcome here to the Aga Khan Museum, and I want to congratulate the museum um, on, on holding this exhibit, uh, which is our staging this exhibit, which recognizes connections uh, amongst the indigenous peoples of Canada uh, and other cultures. And, and I'm very pleased to have a poem uh, that is part of the exhibit, and a poem that speaks about my own uh, mixed heritage, which may not be absolutely uh, uh, visible to you. Um, and, and I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to perceive me as representing a whole series of different potential ethnicities. It's okay because I can tell you that whenever I travel across this country and internationally, I'm often stopped uh, and questioned about exactly who I am and exactly where I was born uh, because my particular complexion and hair and accent 
seem to suggest lots of possibilities to lots of border guards uh, and, and lots of, of uh, airport security folks as well. Um, who are often surprised that I don't happen to know Arabic or are surprised uh, that I was born in Canada and are surprised uh, that I, I don't have a Jamaican accent or are surprised that I don't speak Spanish and, and so on. So I have, I've had lots of experience uh, trying to explain my presence on this planet and my particular mix of DNA uh, to lots of folks over the years. And so as I edge into speaking about reconciling First Nations and, and Afro-Métis identity, um, I'll just uh, 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 share with you a number of, of the identities I have been accorded. Um, I've been uh, uh, thought to be Chinese. I have been uh, described as being Malaysian. Um, I've been uh, described as Turkish. Um, I've been, of course, um, uh, thought to be Cuban, um, African-American, except that my accent isn't quite correct uh, for the African-American identity, uh, and, and, uh, I, and uh, uh, yeah, so there's been a whole range of, of, of these identities I've, I've been given. What I'm almost never, never identified as being is First Nations. I'm almost never identified as being thought of as being part native or as Métis. And in fact, the first time in my life that I was ever um, uh, told uh, that I was in fact uh, native or had some native characteristics or was part indigenous and so forth was uh, when I was uh, 39 years old, back, way back in 1999. A native woman, a Métis woman in British Columbia uh, took one look at me and said, you are part native. I was so floored. I was so amazed. And she gave me a package of sweet grass and, and, and sent shivers down my spine and sent shivers down my spine today to be recognized as having a partial uh, indigenous identity. So I want to talk about that a little bit more than maybe uh, in the, in the uh, question period. I can share some of my scariest border crossing anecdotes with you. Uh, and so on, um, but maybe I'll do that right away, just just to get it out of the just to get out of the way and and uh, give you something to uh, smile at, uh, or perhaps shake your heads at, and so forth. This goes back to 2014, and and I was uh, uh, in Scandinavia. I happened to have been in Finland. I was on my way back to uh, the United States to Boston, where I was at that point uh, uh, teaching at Harvard as a visiting professor. Uh, and so I, I had a flight itinerary that went from Helsinki to Stockholm and then a uh, direct flight from Stockholm to Boston. And, and uh, when I was changing uh, aircraft in, uh, in Stockholm, uh, getting ready to leave one flight and board an American Airlines flight to get to Boston, um, I had to pass through security and the metal detector and so forth. And of course, as someone who travels a lot, I know what to pack and what not to pack. So no alarms were set off, but that didn't matter. Two security guards still approached me and asked for my ID, my passport, uh, which I produced uh, for them. Then they started to basically kind of massage the passport and try and riffling the pages and tugging at the pages to see if it might come apart. But you know, it's an, it's an official government of Canada passport, so it's not completely tacky. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and they continued to fiddle with it just to see if there might be something wrong with it in some way, shape, or form. And then they kept asking me over and over, you were born in Canada? Yes, I was born in Canada, that's what the passport says. Uh, are you sure you, were, you weren't born someplace else? My mom uh, did not tell me I was born anywhere else but in Canada, uh, and, and so on. And so finally, because they were not satisfied with either the passport or my truthful answers to their, to their questions, they asked me if I had any other piece of ID that could establish for sure that I was actually Canadian. Uh, and I happened to have, completely by accident, my Ontario driver's license. So thank you, province of Ontario. Uh, you saved the day, but that still, even that was not quite uh, good enough for them because then they wanted to know if I knew how to make a bomb. They wanted to know if I was carrying a bomb. They wanted to know if I, if I could identify a bomb if I happened to be carrying one. Uh, and and uh, 
luckily I was able to say uh, uh, no uh, to, to these questions, except I did say that I've seen people with bombs in movies, so yeah, maybe I could identify a bomb in that way, uh, given my exposure to them in popular culture. Uh, and I've completely forgot, luckily for me, I completely forgot that a long time ago, 1975, for my grade nine science project, I designed an atomic bomb. Uh, <laughs> it's, a good thing, it's a good thing I didn't uh, remember that at that particular moment. Anyway, they were finally, um, uh, they had to give up, essentially. They were still kind of unsure about, uh, about uh, my identity, but they eventually had to give me back my, my passport and let me proceed. Uh, but before I, I, I left their purview, uh, they asked me, was this too much? Did you really find this to be too much to deal with? And I said, yes. You know, it really was. And, and uh, you should get used to the fact that there are people who are brown in complexion who are also Canadian. Uh, I'm not going to be the last one that you ever encounter. So get used to that, uh, folks in Stockholm. Anyway, um, sorry for that little anecdote, but here we go. Identity. I begin with a poem. Being pure song, Métis, my charisma's ambiguous like dark wine that's rosé. And my tongue sports obscene mutterings, cusses, squats and squiggles, ripples and raps, clear and superficial as ink, trenchant as prayer. The carnal, ungodly poet, that's me, acid bathed, not sugar coated, an ecstatic monster, a jabbering chimp. Should I be as colorless but bloody as Whitehall, the White House, Versailles, and La Tour de Belém, and other slave capitals? I lark with crows, make Camelot a hell. I'm rooted in the sargasso. My smile backstabs. I hurl Bibles at you like stones. In autumn 1978, I was 18, attending a youth multiculturalism conference in Halifax. When I first heard the term indigenous used to refer to the historical black settler population of Nova Scotia, and that's where I'm from. Um, on my mother's side, uh, if we leave out my indigenous connections, I'm seventh generation Canadian as a result of black Americans who fled to Nova Scotia during the War of 1812. And in fact, my, my maternal African-American ancestors arrived in Nova Scotia in 1813. Uh, so I just want to pause to say that for all the many people who ask me every now and then, where are you from? Where are you really from? If they happen to be Canadian, I can probably tell them I've been Canadian longer than they have and longer than their grandparents were and so on and so forth. But in any event, this is when I first heard this uh, term, Indigenous. And if memory serves, it was my then mentor, the brilliant actor, gifted poet and playwright, and polemical journalist Walter Borden, who employed the term to distinguish those of us of long residency in Nova Scotia, in Canada, from more recent black arrivals, most from the Caribbean, and a smattering from the United States and from Africa. I probably first began to use the phrase myself, indigenous black. For as I was beginning to voyage beyond Nova Scotia as a university student, I began to encounter brother and sister blacks from other parts of the African diaspora who would wonder, like many white folks, just who the hell was I anyway? And what strange black culture did I possess when bagpipes could make me weep, almost as sentimentally as any Motown Hurton song? In identifying myself as an indigenous black Nova Scotian. I meant no disrespect to the real indigenous people, the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, nor was I out to erase their claim to original presence, to an absolute indigeneity. What I was trying to do, like Borden and like the Africadian activist Rocky Burnley Jones, was demarcate this small forgotten band of African more or less Americans from other newer black Canadians because we were in fact different despite our allegiance to the rhetoric of Pan-Africanism. And before I go any further, I gotta mention the fact that today is Louis Riel Day, which is a day that's very important for anyone claiming any degree of Métis uh, uh, allegiance or connection and so forth. And as I'm sure everyone here knows, Louis Riel was the radical, seditious, against the state 
uh, a radical rebel leader of Métis and indigenous people on the Great Plains, Saskatchewan, uh, and, and of course Manitoba. Also, he's one of the fathers of Confederation, but as you know, because he rebelled against uh, John A. Macdonald, who of course has been receiving lots of critique these days for having been a bit of a racist, uh, maybe uh, being very much a racist, uh, to be really clear and precise about that. Uh, but because he rebelled um, and, and uh, uh, committed treason against the federal government, he was eventually hanged and today is the anniversary of his execution, actually. So I want to uh, represent or, or mention him. Uh, but our difference as black Nova Scotians was in fact native. I use that word deliberately with a small n. Unlike the newer black Canadians, we could not look back only one generation to some other native land where we were either the majority or could wield significant power. Nor could we appeal to any foreign embassy to intervene with the governments of Canada and Nova Scotia to address our concerns. We were not only renters in cities, we held land in impossible to farm districts that were practically reserves, from which we filed mornings to work as cheap labor in white homes and in white controlled cities and towns. You may not know this, but I will share with you this fact. When uh, blacks arrived in Nova Scotia in numbers between 1760 uh, and 1815, we, our ancestors were settled outside uh, mainly white towns and villages. And of course, in a part of Halifax that became known as Africville. In other words, from the very beginning of black settlement in Nova Scotia, we were segregated. Our communities were strictly segregated to the extent that uh, uh, in some places we were not allowed to own land. Our ancestors were not allowed to own land in some of the white towns and white villages in Nova Scotia. At the same time, if they happened to work in a town, a white town, they might be expected to leave that town by sundown. That was actually a law in the town of Digby, Nova Scotia that was on the books until 1967, uh, the centennial year of Canada. If you were black and you lived in, and, and you worked in Digby, you had to be out of town by sundown. This is not the South, this is not Dixie, this is Nova Scotia, Canada, and it's not that long ago, I'm 57. So this is only 50 years ago that that law was still on the books in the town of, in the town of Digby. So some of these ca Caucasian settlements, as I was just mentioning, had these sunset laws that said you had to be out of town by sundown. The effect of these provisions, the segregated communities, uh, the fact that you couldn't, you couldn't live in the white communities in some cases, the effect of these laws was to render African Nova Scotians, or to use my word, Africadians, a virtual squatter class, dependent on low wage employment from racialist white bosses to survive on their hard scrabble lots about as sustaining nutritionally and economically as cemetery plots. And it's important to understand that this racially motivated economic marginalization was a product of official colonial Nova Scotian policy carried on into post-Confederation Nova Scotia and well into the 20th century, into the 1960s. So Africadians got landed, I mean accorded land, given land, which no matter how barren or stony or swampy, allowed for a sense of community and of home ownership, even if it also meant that kinship ties and emotional ties to the land, plus dependence on nearby white employment, plus a lack of access to effective schooling meant that one wasn't going to probably want to leave or venture very far from the hood. Uh, in stark contrast to first generation West Indian immigrants from the 1950s especially, Africadians were considerably poor, proverbially illiterate, with few valued skills and little class mobility, except to jump on a train or bus and go to Montreal or Toronto, Hogtown, I should say. Uh, maybe I should say the six. Maybe I should say the big crab apple, uh, as opposed to the big apple, it's the big crab apple, Toronto. Boston or New York. So, except for relatively isolated Preston, which still has the largest all black community in Canada. I want you to think about that for a moment the largest all-black community in Canada, not segregated, but all-black, 
5,000 people. That's just uh, 10 miles or so uh, outside uh, the capital city of Halifax. It's still there. They've got their own volunteer fire department, black fire department, for crying out loud. Uh, and, and uh, of course, their own church and, and so on, and very strong community ties. And that's a community that goes all the way back to the 18th century, uh, Preston, North Preston, and there's also East Preston, and so on. So except for uh, relatively isolated Preston and its environs, uh, the historical black Nova Scotian community was essentially colored with a capital C, especially in the Annapolis Valley, on the South Shore, in the Northeast, and even in Halifax it itself. Our blackness is really Métis. Our blackness in Nova Scotia is generally mixed. It's generally a whole bunch of colors and so on. And I want to describe them brown and tan, and copper, and gold, and yellow, and indigo, and ivory, and blue, and even white. No matter how much we align ourselves, black Nova Scotians, culturally and politically, with the larger African diaspora, and even with our kissing cousins in America, our kissing cousins in America, we were and we remain a community apart. Scholars even recognize the existence of African Nova Scotian vernacular English, a version of African American vernacular English that is as distinct as the variant spoken in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. Because I felt as a writer and a scholar that black Nova Scotian or African Nova Scotian or even indigenous black did not and do not answer to our specificity as a broken off branch of African America, landed and abandoned in coastal British North America, I invented the term Africadian to describe us, our essence and our being, and I dubbed our communities, our land base, Africadia. So Africadia basically means a place abounding in Africans. It's based on a Mi'kmaq word. Not everybody agrees with this. Not everybody agrees with my thinking about uh, black Nova Scotia and Africadia and, and, and so on. And one of the persons who disagrees with me is a scholar by the name of Paula Madden, who says that by trying to claim an Africadian identity and identify black Nova Scotian or Africadian communities, I, and making a claim against the Mi'kmaq people. I, she says, am making a claim against the land and territory of Mi'kmaq. Uh, so from her perspective, uh, folks who complain, for instance, about Africa must be ignorant and insolent uh, uh, in terms of complaining about the obliteration of the destruction of that community, uh, 1964, 1970, because after all, if there is no such thing as an Africadian, if there is no such thing as a historical black Nova Scotian, if there is no such thing as, as being able to claim a, a landed identity with communities and property and homes and schools and a volunteer fire department going back centuries, if we cannot identify ourselves as being a unique, special culture amongst the, the African diaspora, then uh, why should we complain about the destruction of Africville? Because Africville is one of our communities. How can we complain about it? Because Africville was sitting on Mi'kmaq land. So how can we complain about the destruction of Africville if we have no right to this identity that I am outlining for you right now? So these questions about identity are never innocent. They're never innocent. There's always a political and economic uh, and, 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 and often just put the two together, political, uh, uh, economic uh, 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 tension around any group's claiming of a particular identity because someone else is going to feel that you're horning in on their territory, uh, so to speak. And another complaint I have with Madden's thesis from 2009 is that uh, uh, she argues that the collaborations between Africans and indigenous people or Afro-Abo, I will say, African, Aboriginal, Afro-Abo, are very awkward and don't make much sense. Uh, she charges that, uh, also that the phrase indigenous black uh, means that black Nova Scotians are denying our connection to the African diaspora and denying African solidarity, that we're separating ourselves from immigrant blacks like herself, whose roots are not indigenous, but uh, nevertheless represent uh, 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 a presence, a new presence. Her charges are significant and I do feel that I have to uh, reply. 
Uh, and, and this gets into the heart of my, of my talk. Because what she, what Madden refuses to recognize, what Madden drives me mad, refusing to recognize is the fact that many Africadians, many African Nova Scotians like myself are Métis. We are Afro-Métis. We are Afro-Indigenous. We are mixed gloriously with uh, uh, Indigenous people, uh, with Caucasians, Europeans. We are a community that is not pure, that is not only one thing. We are a glorious mixture of all kinds of folks who ended up calling Nova Scotia home or ending up in Nova Scotia or who are in fact uh, still indigenous uh, to Nova Scotia. But she ignores this fact and she has to ignore it because if she didn't ignore it, her whole argument would fall apart. Uh, so I don't, I don't blame her in some ways. Uh, so if we, but if we wanna recognize this fact that African Nova Scotians, many of us Africadians are in fact Métis, that is to say mixed with First Nations peoples, um, uh, then that means that uh, we have a right uh, to this identity and this very particular black identity. Um, Dorothy Proctor Mills published a memoir back in 2010 which is titled Born Again Indian, a story of self-discovery of a red black woman and her people. Uh, uh, Dorothy Proctor, uh, uh, I think has done trailblazing, pioneering work in looking at connections between uh, black people and indigenous people, especially in Nova Scotia. And, and uh, she answers a question, maybe she's wrong with her answer, I'm not sure, but I like her answer, but the question that she addresses in her memoir is, why is it that so many uh, black and, and, and indigenous people, red black people or black red people don't recognize do not recognize their indigenous heritage, do not recognize that they are Métis. Why is it that so many of us do not claim indigeneity, even though we have it, do not claim uh, our connection to indigenous peoples? And she says that is because of racism, but in a very particular application of racism, she says that whenever African and Aboriginal people got together because of just the different DNA involved, uh, the children of these unions came out looking lighter complexioned than, the, uh, than either parent. And so in order to pass the children off as being mulatto, to use a horrible term, uh, as being mixed race, as being part black, part white, well, you can see already where I'm going with this, a lot of parents having a lighter complected child a lighter looking child, a whiter looking child, even though the parents were African and indigenous, African and Aboriginal, pretended that in fact they had white ancestry, pretended in fact that they were part white in order to uh, uh, put forward the children as being part white. This was done in order to try to mitigate the anti-black and anti-indigenous racism anti-black and anti-indigenous racism. So what some parents did long time ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, what they did was say, oh yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're part white. That's your, that's your ancestry and, and so on. Uh, and, and, and so that might help you, depending on how you look, that might help you avoid uh, the worst uh, possibilities of anti-black and anti-white racism and so forth. It's a very interesting theory, and I believe that there might be something to it. So I'm happy to share that uh, uh, with you. No one can tell how vast this camouflage was, this conspiracy of camouflage, of camouflaging origins. No one can tell how vast it was. Uh, but I can tell you that as a card-carrying member, oh, I don't have my card with me, it's at home, I am a card-carrying member of the Eastern Woodlands Métis Nation Nova Scotia. The Eastern Woodlands Métis Nation Nova Scotia. And in order to get that card, I had to establish my bloodlines, my connections to indigene indigeneity on my mother's side, uh, most definitely. So I'm happy to say I'm not in any kind of Joseph Boyden uh, 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 crisis here. I'm happy to tell you that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Well, with, with all due respect, then props to Brother Joseph. Props to Brother Joseph. I'm just happy to say that I don't have to 
uh, go into any kind of, of uh, uh, ex uh, explanation uh, pre uh, presentation and so forth. Uh, my records are on file with the government in Nova Scotia for crying out loud. And they must know what they're doing. They must know what they're doing. I'm going to say that. Um, so I do believe that there are many Africadians with Aboriginal and or Mi'kmaq ancestry who know nothing of their roots and who are a mystery both to themselves and to purebred natives. Uh, Proctor Mills tells us, to be sure, there were black Indians in other parts of Canada, but not as many as in Nova Scotia. She also insists many red black people are quantitatively more Indian than black, but because of their African features, it is difficult for them to broach the subject. It appears to be much easier to claim white blood than Indian blood. Indeed, many African Nova Scotian communities and surnames are simultaneously essentially Métis and Mi'kmaq. And I can talk about communities like Three Mile Plains where my mother's family is from and where I still own land in Nova Scotia, Mount Denson, Truro, Lakeel, and others. And the surnames, Croxon, Francis, Johnson, Robinson, States, these are surnames shared by indigenous people in Nova Scotia as well as those who identify as being black. So uh, none of this information that I'm sharing with you is meant to challenge indigenous primordiality in so-called Nova Scotia. However, the truth of black and Mi'kmaq metissage complicates any too easy and too pat division between our two communities and also, I think, uh, uh, kills the simplistic notions regarding the political serialism, supposed serialism of Africadian land, land claims. The fact of the matter is, and I don't care who gets upset about it, the uncomfortable fact is, or maybe I should say the comfortable fact is, African heritage peoples and the first peoples, first nations, are intertwined prodigiously, intertwined prodigiously in Nova Scotia, even if both entities are ignorant of this reality and history, and they have much in common beginning with DNA and extending to cultural assertion. In my own family, matrilineal, aboriginal, and African, I see aunts, uncles, cousins, who can pass not as white, but as native. When I look at First Nations representatives or meet our people in my travels, I see folks who resemble many Africadians. Yes, I identify myself, and I usually am identified by others as being black, but I boast around my ears what older folks call Micmac curls. And my, <clears throat> handsome, gorgeous tint, I'll call, it, I'll call it gold cinnamon, just because, uh, cinnamon gold, gold cinnamon. Anyway, uh, it's common to those of us who have some aboriginal admixture. I take pride in uncles, aunts, and cousins who never gave up, passed down knowledge of forestry work, wilderness cultivation and survival, herbal medicine, and all the lore associated with these activities. When I consider my inherited, uncultivated, three-quarter of an acre lot on Highway 1 and Three Mile Plains. So utterly wild with spruce, pine, and crab apple trees, blackberry bushes, and anthills. I got a whole bunch of anthills on my three quarters of an acre. And I'm still very happy about it. And don't anybody go and take my crab apples because they're, they're my crab apples. And they are very sour and very green and, and so forth, and usually kind of wormy too. So be very careful if you happen to step on that land. And I like my spruce, and I like my pine tree, and, and, and uh, uh, my blackberry bushes, which are kind of scraggly, but the berries are kind of tasty. They're about this big. Uh, they're very, very small, but still kind of tasty. But in any event, um, uh, I do feel romantically one with the land and my native cultures, plural. When I consider the late and esteemed Africadian basket weaver, Edith Clayton, I wonder just how much of her craft was indebted to West Africa and how much to Mi'kmaq. When I consider the late and heroic Mi'kmaq activist, Donald Marshall Jr., once wrongfully convicted and jailed for murdering an Africadian teen, a crime actually committed by a white derelict, I understand afresh just how similar have been Aboriginal and Africadian experiences of racism in New Scotland, New Valley Coast, Nova Scotia. When I read the late and gifted Mi'kmaq poet, Rita Joe, I feel that I am reading a sister with the only major distinction between us being her access to a truly indigenous tongue, one that is remote to me. When I read the African-American cultural critic, Bell Hooks, 
Gloria Watkins and her essay, Revolutionary Renegades, Native Americans, African Americans, and Black Indians, about the political bonds between African Americans and Native Americans, I feel that she could have and should have added a paragraph on Africadia. Occasionally, mischievously, I almost feel moved to redefine Africadian as denoting a Métis who identifies with African American culture. Then again, perhaps I should offer such a redefinition, given that many of us culturally black Africadians have also been formally accepted again into the Eastern Woodlands Métis Nation, Nova Scotia, a fact that defines us legally as Aboriginal under Section 35 of the Canada Constitution Act 1982. Uh, I think that, that uh, uh, if our understanding of Métis, if our understanding of, indig of indigeneity may expand to include multiculturally those who are part indigenous, no matter what their complexions may be, we will move faster towards a, 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 a position where we can truly talk about Canada being a just society where we can truly talk about everyone's uh, uh, roots and cultures being respected as part of one of the world's better nations, one of the world's better governed nations, one of the world's greatest nations. I want us to be uh, one day in that uh, 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 vicinity of something called true justice when all of us are welcomed equally no matter what our complexion might be, no matter what our origins might be, no matter what or how much indigeneity we can claim as being full uh, Canadians, full citizens with all the rights uh, and privileges appertaining and no questions and nobody tearing apart your passport. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read a few poems that talk about, again, this, this uh, uh, mixed identity. Uh, and then I'll stop and ask you uh, if you have any questions for me, and I hope you will. Uh, uh, and, I'll, uh, and I also have a, a, a couple more anecdotes I can share with you about crossing borders, uh, if you're interested. And, and, uh, and especially the most, the, the most horrifying and, and the scariest incident I ever had crossing a border was, in fact, going from Ontario to Michigan. Uh, back in 1993, and I, if we have time, I will tell you about that because uh, that was an incident where my life, I'm not being dramatic, my life was in jeopardy as a 33-year-old uh, 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 graduate student, uh, doctoral candidate at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario at the time. Um, uh, that incident was, was uh, life-threatening. So if we have time, I'll tell you about that. Uh, negation. Uh, and before I read the poem, I'll just tell you a little bit about, about the background of this, of this book, which is called Execution Poems. Uh, and and uh, Execution Poems deals with the true story. I take liberties. It's, you know, there's some fictitious stuff in this book. But I had two cousins uh, named George and Rufus Hamilton who were hanged for murder and robbery in New Brunswick in 1949. I knew nothing about these two young men. They were aged 22 and 23 when they died in Fredericton. Uh, uh, New Brunswick, uh, July 1949. I didn't find out about them until I was 34, 1994. When my mother, we were having toast and tea, and my mother leaned over and said, son, did you know you had two cousins who were hanged? <laughs> Typical Nova Scotian tea. Um, and and uh, so as soon as I heard about these guys, I went out and found, a, found out as much as I could about them. And I wrote this collection of poems about these two guys and what happened to them. And the other important point is that they were part black and they were part Micmac. They were part black and part Micmac, just like me. And but unfortunately for them, they made all kinds of terrible decisions that cost another innocent person his life and also ended up costing them their lives. This is the first poem, execution poems, Negation. Le negre negated meager c'est moi. A whiskey-colored provincial uncouth mouth spitting lies. Vomit lyrics musty, masticated scripture. Her majesty's nasty Nova Scotian Negro. I mean to go out shining instead of tarnished, to take apart poetry like a heart. My black face must preface murder for you. Ballad of a Hanged Man. This is a poem in the voice of one of the brothers, uh, George Hamilton. 
after he's arrested and he's, and he's being held in prison awaiting trial, he, of course, uh, is questioned and he gives uh, uh, this confession uh, or this statement in, at, his, at his trial, actually. And so I read through the trial transcripts, 1,500 pages, and, and came up with this poem, Ballad of a Hanged Man in the voice of George Hamilton. Their drinks to my drinks feels different. I'll stomach a stammering teaspoonful, but Roach laps up half the half bottle. He slops glass for glass with the best. I sidle in easy, the taxi with a hammer harsh in my pocket. See, as a wed man, I don't care if I wear uglified overalls, but I ain't gonna hear my child starve. I had the intention to ruck some money in my own heart. I wanted to rape money because I was screwed in my own heart. I took scared shaking inside of me. I knows Fredericton report reporters can prove zoot suit vine style, not my viciousness. I was shaking all that evening, my mind shaking, but my child was hungered. Have you ever gone in your life going two days without eating? And whenever you get money, you're going to eat and eat regardless of all the bastards in Fredericton was busting the head, skull Jimmy open. This is what I'm sermonizing in English. Homemade brew, dug up fresh, tastes like molasses. We had some, some good. Logic does not break down these things, sir. If I hadn't dropped the hammer, laughing, silver would be laughing now, laughing, silver, moon, and snow dropped on the ground. Two pieces of bone driven two inches deep in his brain. What's deeper still, the bones of the skull were bashed into the brain. Blood railed out. I was so mixed up. My mind bent crooked. Silver's neck, face, and hand bleached cold. Inside the sedan, 19 black, 49 sobbing Ford. Outside, snow and ice smelling red stained. I ain't dressed this story up. I am enough disgraced. I swear to the truths I know. I wanted to uphold my wife and child. Hang me and I'll not hold them again. Uh, something for fun, because of, you know, that's a kind of little bit serious poem. So this is just for fun. Uh, and this represents the multiculturalism of Canada, the multiculturalism of Halifax. Uh, and the poem is called Haligonian Market Cry. And sometimes people think, I'm not getting off on a tangent here, I just want to say this, I got to get this out. Sometimes people think multiculturalism is a new thing in Canada. That Pierre Trudeau said multiculturalism in 1971, October 1971 in the House of Commons, and all of a sudden Canada was multicultural. I think this is, this is a falsehood, and we should not allow that falsehood to be perpetrated. I want to say to you that especially if we want to think about the indigenous occup uh, occupiers, or original peoples of this land, then we have to say, given the multitude of First Nations, we have to say that Canada always was multicultural. What we call Canada now was always multicultural from time, uh, primordial time, always multicultural. We want to talk about the arrival of European settlers uh, beginning uh, especially in the, in the uh, 16th century. And if we want to talk about the arrival of Africans as slaves uh, uh, and then as people escaping slavery in the uh, uh, 18th and 19th centuries, we want to talk about the arrival of Chinese uh, to, to Canada to help build the railway. We want to talk about the Russians arriving in British Columbia 150 years ago, fleeing war and fleeing dictatorship in Tsarist Russia, wanting to have have a pacifist uh, community, Dukabur community in British Columbia. We want to talk about Japanese coming to Canada to be fishermen in the early part of uh, the last part of the 19th century, early 20th century. There's no way anybody can lie about Canada only becoming multicultural in the last 50 years, the last 40 years, the last 30 years, the last 20 years, the last 10 years. That's a lie. Canada always was multicultural, always was from the very beginning. It is simply more multicultural now, and folks should get used to it. Haligonian market cry. So this poem is based on the voices of the Halifax marketplace. I got 
Hallelujah, watermelons, virginal pears, virtuous corn, Munichaic et altera winket, luscious fat ass watermelons, plump pears, big butt corn, Lagusta estehardine, come and get it, cucumbers, hot to trot, lust fresh cucumbers, voulez-vous coucher avec moi, water melons, go to church and get redeemed, water melons, oh peccatory in verita, good God, cucumbers, righteous peers, golden Baptist corn, they really stopped their eye and like their cough, I got sluttish, Watermelons, sinful cucumbers, jail bait pears, planted by Big Mouth Chaucer and picked by Sugar Shakespeare. Uh, I, I've got to I'll read one more poem, which is part of the exhibit, and then I'll, I'll ask you if you have any questions, and please don't be shy. Um, and uh, this, this poem, I wrote when I was 17. I'm really, really very pleased it's part of this exhibit. So when I was 17, that's 40 years ago, 1977, for crying out loud. Um, and I was visiting my grandparents' uh, home in Three Mile Plains, which as I already explained is a mixed white, black, uh, native community going back 200 years, uh, where, again, I still own some anthills. So very nice. Uh, I have now seen as my response as a teenager thinking about my mixed heritage and what this place means for me and the poem is part of the exhibit. I have now seen nestled twixt warped ties of rusted train tracks, snow, aged, dingy, gray and black, frosting loose, brown dirt and jumbled gravel, while a stream hisses neath thin dull ice and look out over fields flecked with patches of grisaille, grass, the tint of putty, and wind subdued gasps, intimations of winter seasonal assassinations. Under ledges of runaway clouds, my love hunting eyes view stark outhouses, the dirty snow frames under a dust bowl sun. The pothole pock dirt road sprawls toward the pine serrated horizon, where dirt where rough edged hills lined with chicken wire fences, sagging barns and derelict farms unfurl also. I see ragtag scarecrows murdered by knifing winds, bleeding straw in the snow-snuffed fields. Among broken wagon wheels, the last monuments to rid dust cowboys who once twanged moon June silver spoon tunes to hayride Madonnas on rickety house steps, bordered by violently ruddy roses and dead conches holding the ocean's roar. This is the now and then, the future and the past. The hollow corpse of a 57 Chevy lays half interred in a rambling drift, half smothered by the ivory quicksand. Suddenly, the shrieking banshee horn of a rushing steel juggernaut boxcar hauler resounds and detonates across these hilly plains where fir trees, evergreen, point directly to stars, visible or not, that pinpoint where Aquarius strides with his medicine water of galaxies gleaming, pouring silver against indigo velvet, an ancestral African rocks his wooden rocker in a clapboard cabin heated by an iron black wood stove that percolates scents of cornbread and rabbit stew, a still life or home sweet home vignette presenting a weeping folk guitar and white smoke lifting from a gnarled mahogany pipe. Add a disordered wood pile, a dead orange tractor and evacuated dreams. I have this old man Zulu spear, actually a Micmac cane. I have this old man's Zulu spear. No, actually, it's a Micmac cane. And I perforate snowbanks with the crooked wooden point. From now on, if I must cry, let the tears signal joy. Three Mile Plains, Nova Scotia, 19th of February, 1977. So here's the story about the Michigan border crossing. So I'm a PhD candidate uh, in English at Queen's University. And I'm invited to speak at the University of Southwestern Michigan in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And to get from Kingston, Ontario to Kalamazoo, Michigan, the most sensible way to go was by train. Uh, and, and so I jumped on the train on a Tuesday. 
uh, via rail, and then of course in Toronto, switch over to Amtrak, and, and then at Sarnia, uh, cross the border along with all the other Canadians, of course, and, and everybody else on the train, we all cross the border from Sarnia to Port Huron, Michigan, and the train is stopped. And the border police, uh, US border police, uh, Immigration Naturalization Service folks, not Homeland Security yet at this point, 1993, uh, board the train and begin to ask us for our ID and to question our reasons for visiting the United States and so on. Uh, the officer who approached me uh, had, had really badgered a fellow sitting behind me, demanding to see how much money he had on him. Uh, it turned out he had $100 uh, US and so he was allowed to continue unmolested on his, on his journey. Uh, so I thought, oh my golly, they're giving this fellow a hard time. What's going to happen to me? Uh, I hadn't really uh, been in the U.S. very much at that point in my life, up to that age. I think I'd crossed the border five or six times in my entire life at that point. Uh, so I was a little bit nervous about the whole thing, even though it's only, only the U.S. border. I was still kind of nervous about it. But anyway... Uh, the, the officer finished up with the fellow sitting behind me, and he came to me and asked for my passport and asked for my uh, uh, train ticket. And he asked me, what am, I, what am I going to do? What was I planning to do in the United States? And I said, I'm going to give a talk on poetry. Absolute truth. I was giving a talk on Canadian poetry at the University of Southwestern Michigan. So he uh, says, really, you're giving a talk on poetry? I said, yeah. And he said, okay, so when are you returning? I said, well, you have my ticket. Uh, it shows I'm returning on Thursday. This is Tuesday, so the day after tomorrow. He said, you're coming back by train? I said, yep, you got my train ticket. I'm coming back by train on Thursday at this time, as it, as it indicates on the ticket. He said, great, fine, carry on. And that was that. So I went to the university, gave my talk. Thursday, I'm back on the train, uh, returning to Canada. And we get to Port Huron, they stop the train. And I thought, that's really odd. Why should they stop the train here? They should stop the train in Sarnia once we cross the border and let the Canadian border uh, uh, police uh, uh, agency uh, check us all out. But no, the train was stopped in, in uh, Port Huron, just, just inside the American side of the border. And, and, uh, and the announcement was made that all Canadians must uh, uh, detrain. We all had to get off the train. So there were about a dozen of us. And so I joined roughly 11 others, and, and for the record, I gotta mention it, I was the only black male uh, uh, in, in this group of, of 12 or so. And, and uh, uh, so there we are, we're on the station platform, and then out of nowhere, and I'm not exaggerating, a SWAT team appears <laughs> with machine guns and the dark sunglasses and the flak jackets and, and so on, and, and some dogs. It was like a scene out of Midnight Express, if I can refer back to that, to that film jocularly, uh, keeping in mind that it is also uh, uh, full of racial stereotypes, so I don't mean to give any support to those stereotypes. What I'm really trying to indicate here is that I felt, I felt like I was in a police state um, at this particular moment. And, and uh, so this squad of, of, I wanna say soldiers, but I'll say police, surround us on the, on the platform. And, and then slowly but surely, as their training would allow, uh, isolate me, uh, this group of, of guys, uh, heavily armed, as far as I'm concerned, they're all heavily armed, and, and, uh, and, uh, and also their dogs, which of course are sniffing for drugs, are now focused on me. And they keep throwing something down by my feet and telling the dogs, find it, find it. And the dogs are going crazy, but they're not finding it. What, you know, whatever they're supposed to find, they're not finding it. They're running around all over the place, but they can't find what I know they, uh, they thought uh, I would be carrying, drugs, right? But no, uh, th th it was a fruitless search. And so then one of the officers approached me, and he had a really nervous, frightened look on his face. He was more nervous and frightened than I was. And he said, sir, would you mind taking part in a demonstration? And again, Midnight Express came to my mind. And I thought, holy smokes, I better not say, I better not, I can't say no. I can't, I can't say that, that I don't want to be part of this demonstration. Who knows what will happen next? 
uh, with all these uh, guys around? And how, do, and how well are they trained? Do they all have itchy trigger fingers? Uh, and, and they might say, well, we thought he was reaching for a weapon, and, so, and then all of a sudden, you know, the gun, a gun uh, burps once and, and I'm dead or dying. Um, so I thought, I don't really have much choice here. I better say yes. And so at that point, keeping in mind I'm not the most virtuous person on the planet, but at that point in my life, it was the only time in my life I was ever given hard drugs. And it was given to me by the police. <laughs> the police actually gave me crack cocaine to hold uh, so they could test out to see whether the dogs would recognize that I was holding this, this contraband that they gave me uh, to hold. So uh, this time the dogs jumped up and, and uh, their noses touched my hand and they did that a couple times and, th and then they were satisfied that the only drugs I had were the drugs that they gave me property of the United States government. Uh, so uh, the fellow who had approached me very nervously before now came, uh, uh, approached me with a very sorry look, like he had like a, a disgusted look. You have to say, well, that didn't work, right? And, and he was kind of like upset with this whole sting operation that hadn't stung uh, uh, me. So um, he, uh, of course, took back his drugs and, and everybody disappeared. As fast as the SWAT team uh, had, had come out of wherever they were, they all, gone, disappeared again. Uh, and so and we all started to go back to the train. And I started to turn around on, on the platform and return to the train. And as I did, as I turned around, I realized that someone was standing immediately behind me. Uh, immediately behind me, right, as, as, I, as I turned and, and I came face to face with the guard who had questioned me two days before. And he's a t he was a tall fellow, uh, and so I'm looking up at him, he's looking down at me, and I'm looking into his mirror sunglasses, I'll never forget it. And he said with a sneer, and I cannot imitate his tone of voice, except I can tell you he was sneering, and he said, you came down here to talk about poetry. And that's when I realized what this whole thing was about. You know, I could not possibly be a black brown man uh, uh, giving a university lecture. I impossible, impossible. It had to, I had to be the world's worst drug trafficker <laughs> to come up with an excuse like, I'm giving a talk on poetry. And I'm really coming down here to get all kinds of crack cocaine and take it back up to Toronto. I mean, I mean, cr I, but on the other hand, you got to think to yourself, how puny a brain that officer had. How puny the brains of all of his colleagues and supervisors that they bought this idea that, uh, that I was supposedly some kind of drug trafficker uh, because of the truthful declaration I made about my reasons for going to the United States. And their reaction was to put on this racist uh, 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 show of, of force and clowning. Uh, it, was, it was military clowning that they were engaged in. And I say that now with a, with a, with a degree of spite, but I assure you at the time, I was very uh, cooperative, very cooperative. Oh yeah, I was cooperating left, right, and center. Anything they want, a, a, anything they want to ask me, no problem. Uh, because I wanted to get out of that situation uh, with all my faculties and all my limbs uh, and, and breath in my lungs. Um, and, and, uh, and all that. So I get back to Ottawa, I call the U.S. Embassy and I ask, you know, is this appropriate behavior? <laughs> is this appropriate behavior? And they said, no, no, it's not. It should not have happened. I said, okay, great. So then I did a very Canadian thing. I wrote a letter asking for an apology. Uh, as opposed to calling up the, the biggest international law firm around and, and suing for multi-millions of dollars for the humiliation, the racial profiling, and endangering my life uh, in, the way that they, in the way that they did. But I was too naive. I just thought, well, I'll just ask for an apology. And guess what? They wrote back and said, we're sorry. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>